Greetings family, this is Bomani Taimba and we're live on Revolutionary Cam and we're here to talk about race first and the whole nation building aspect of things going on in this modern day 21st century and this is the book that we're using as a reference to connect all the things we got going on Africa for the Africans, UNIA, CBPM and a lot of energy from black organization and structure and I'm here with my good brother and he's here to do a nice uh, introduction of himself and we're here to get into this conversation about race first and the importance of the vision of Marcus Garvey. Yes indeed. Uh, I'm Tashaka Sumani. I'm a uh, founding member, charter member of Division 614 Turner Tubman Roy Columbus, Ohio, uh, UNIA ACL. And uh, that division was actually chartered and uh, first of all we're under President Fred Cox II. And under his leadership, our division was formed after this centennial, excuse me, at the centennial of the UNIA ACL in Harlem. Uh, right now, I serve as a, as a vice president pro tem. I also serve as the historian for the division because Columbus, Ohio is significant in Garveyism as well as Dayton, Ohio, as well as Youngstown, Ohio. And uh, given an opportunity, we will get into to those things. I'm also chairman emeritus of the Information Technology Board of Appalachia, Ohio. That is the Underground Railroad Part 2 endorsed by the families. Let's go. It's race first. Absolutely, uh, my brother. I really appreciate your energy and uh, coming here to have the, the dialogue. Now, how many times have you read this book, uh, Race First? I've read this book once. It looked like you've read it one about time. ten times. But you know what? It's so intense. Uh, I guess you keep on going back as a reference. <laughs> which, which we always do. Yeah. You know, if, if we're going to study self, ourselves, we have to study. And then study. But I read this book uh, through the courtesy of our people right. at Thomas W. Harvey Division 121 Liberty Hall, Cecil B. Moore Boulevard in Philly. Excellent. In Philly. And that's, you know, there's, there's the Marcus Gar Garvey Library there. Right. And, I, and I read the book there. Absolutely. Excellent. Uh, so we're going to go into uh, some introduction about the book. Now let's talk about chapter one, which is the main chapter we're going to talk about. Uh, introduction to Marcus Garvey. Now, what are some of the most important things that people in general should know about Marcus Garvey based on race first? And we can just make sure we just get our volume up nice and uh, loud for folks to make sure they hear us clear. Well, what I, what I got out of it, or what I think people should know uh, when they're trying to understand a race first, is that it's very simple. Race first. And once we understand this, we're off and running. The rest is uh, academic. Would people that's say that's I mean. a racist terminology? You know, I have heard that, but I've also learned that when people say it's a racist terminology, I've learned that they have not read the book. Right. They have not taken the time to educate self. And that's really all that would be. All right, perfect. Now let's take us back to Marcus Garvey, um, basic history of Marcus Garvey, because it's not like this is something that we learn in high school and <laughs> And right, elementary school right. and learn and for most yeah. of us if we don't go out and get books like this on joint study groups or black organization a lot of times we don't have this knowledge so yes, um, uh, excellent you know when uh, my age when we were growing up in the 70s you know, I'm a child of the 60s and when we were growing up in the 70s junior high school high school all we got on the UNIA ACL and Garveyism was about half a chapter on it but but of course it's up to us so after we leave high school age that's when we begin to understand Garveyism by reading the philosophy and opinions that was laid down by Amy Jacques Garvey. And that's when we learn and begin to learn and keep learning. Just like this book is worn out from studying. Keep doing it and you will, you will elevate. Our people, what, what we put down in the 1920s is so profound. You can, we, you can study it for five or six years and only begin to understand the level of the government that our people put together for us. Uh, it's just that serious and it's just oh, that time. Well, perfect. Uh, you're giving uh, uh, dates now. You uh, said 1920. Well, well, now let's take take everybody back to when was the UNIA first started? Well, you want to talk about 1914 in Jamaica. And then uh, 1916, 1916 in the U.S. When the Marcus Garvey came to Harlem, right? March of 1916. That's what began Garveyism as we know it today. When, when, when he uh, approached the people on the soapbox and began to articulate the thoughts and ideas of our people. That is my understanding of what began, what we know today, as universal African nationalism with a focus on Sankofa, which is where I hope to get into today with you. That's incredible. You mentioned 1916. We're in 2018, 102 years ago. Now, I, when, I, when I think about 100 years ago, 
I think of the fight for integration, the fight for uh, people wanting to to have equal rights and justice in America. And then here comes Garvey saying race first, let's build a nation in Africa for ourselves. He's talking about Africa for the Africans. This is a hundred years ago. Now, why wasn't this received by more of our people to push in a strong movement versus you know the civil rights movement and independence and and independent and integration i'm tripping over my words family no. because it's it's a yes. word this my division me. president fred cox the second was saying the very thing this this morning we were discussing this well why just this very morning this morning and many people are discussing that very same thing what i want to ask you to do is as we try to like answer it maybe manifest it is restate the question and let's take a look at it say what you just said again Yes, uh, family, uh, what we're looking at is uh, the race first uh, theology. Marcus Garvey, a hundred years ago, vision of Africa for the Africans, of us, instead of uh, fighting for integration and civil rights, his vision was for us to connect with our African brothers on the continent and be a part of the future of an independent Africa. And one of the issues that Marcus Garvey had naturally was almost the entire African continent was colonized. So this was really just a bold move and a bold vision, which people like myself have come to learn that that was the best move because you know our Operation Africa for the Africans is fully in fledged to part of the nation building process of repatriation. And that energy come from uh, Marcus Garvey. So take us mm -hmm. back to the 1920s because that's, that's literally right. four years after Garvey <clears throat> got here in America and established UNIA. Mm -hmm. How were they able to establish such a strong movement within a few years? Well, at that time, okay, we have to put that in context as well. In the 1920s, with the murder of our people. They call it lynching. This is murdering of our people on a consistent basis. At that time, the leaders in opposition to that would have been W.E.B. Du Bois and the NAACP. And what they would do is put it in the Crisis Magazine about it and then post a flag outside the window about it. And that's pretty much all they did about it or said about it until Marcus Garvey showed up. Mm. And when Marcus Garvey showed up, instead of whining about it, complaining about it, he took it from doing something about it to fighting it. And that's what galvanized our people. And that's what my grandma was telling me. So that from, her, from their standpoint, that's what got them to say, wait a minute, something's really going on deeper than what these leaders or misleaders, as Dr. Carter Wilson would say, than what these misleaders were, were putting, putting in front of us because they were scared. They were educated by the oppressor. Their leader was educated by the oppressor, W.E.B. Du Bois. They were all talented, tent, elitist, bougie type Negroes that were, at that time, the only thing our people saw until Marcus Garvey showed up. Yes, yes. Changed the whole thing. Marcus Absolutely. Garvey changed the game I, in America. So you figure, okay, time, okay? History is contemporary. Right. So even though at that time that was going on, okay, let's look at it right now because there's things going on right now. And they will be going on right now, counter to African people, unless Marcus Garvey shows up. Here we are. Look he said in 19, boom, <laughs> in 1923, he said, I am the first Marcus Garvey. There are other cubs in the fold. We're cubs in the fold. Yes. It's on. A hundred years ago, family, Garvey is talking about us. And the, and the strong energy for repatriation and nation building and African continent. We have literally seen that integration has failed. I'm sorry about this family. It's just a sickening thought that, you know, I would just think that out of all of the, the atrocities and pain and suffering that African people have dealt with since they've been stolen from the continent and to be here and think that we can integrate. Right. See, I got it right this time. With our oppressors, our enemies, and people who will never see us as their equal, uh, it begins to be a fact that we are like delusional. And yes. Marcus Garvey it seemed to be one of the few sane energy at that time that was saying, hey, this is not for us. It is delusional. It doesn't seem, it is delusional. It is psychological slavery. That's what's going on. That's why just now, what, 2018, for the past 50 years, we've been asleep. There's been an absolute silence other than the very few people who have kept the Garvey movement going. Other than that, they psychologically put us to sleep when they got rid of Marcus Garvey. So they've been, we've been asleep for about 50 years. Well, but, but we woke up. Well, family, the resurrection <laughs> is hitting you, family. And as we go further into this book, uh, chapter two talks about self-reliance. 
And that's one of the biggest things I got from Garvey overall, that uh, why should we continue to beg our oppressors? Why can't we just focus on organizing our resources and do for self? Now that is the highest honor, and that was what Garvey was about. So the self-reliance has taken our vision to where we're looking at repatriation as that solution. And yes. being a part of the future of the continent, I tell people that you know, a lot of things are going on in the African continent, and we can be a great part of that vision and that future, but we do have to you know, get, get away from this American slave plantation mentality. Um, you know, so we must realize that you know everything is on African content. All we have to do is put our resources together and build what we need. And, and instead of fighting and fighting over and over, to think that uh, we can you know you know we can make this happen here. So we think about the boys. What happened to the boys? Literally towards the end, he ended up in Ghana, right? Yeah. So basically, it's amazing, in, huh? in his whole life. And you realize that he was fighting the wrong battle and fighting against his brother. Right. When he could have, you know, so that right. whole time was lost to where right. he could have really done a lot more. But, you know, he kind of sort of redeemed himself well, towards the end. And he did. And that's something we are learning every, every day. Yeah. We should pay attention to that and keep listening to what these present generals are telling us right now, today. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, what, what we have learned was that okay, the problem with him was his initial study was wrong. It's called The Philadelphia Negro. Then he followed that up in 1915 with a book called The Negro, mm. which was accepted by academia, academia as the epitome of, of sociology, the creation. When in fact, if we go back and study ourselves, which we did, our division did this two years ago in Philly, we see where the problem was. He wasn't studying African people. He was looking at our people from, Euro, from a Eurocentric viewpoint. He was educated at, well, he's from Barrington, he was educated at Harvard and he studied at Berlin. These are Eurocentric institutions. You cannot learn African philosophy, theology, from your oppressor, from the enemy. And that's how he was educated and touted as a top scholar. And they used that against us. But since that time, as we've traced our own selves, we, we did his entire study and blew it out the water. It's absolutely wrong. He was wrong up until the point where he married his second wife. Her name is Shirley Grant. And that's when Du Bois changed. And the reason why I say that is because his second wife was educated at Oberlin. What was Oberlin? Oberlin is the abolitionist university mm. where we're from. So we know, and then when he died, he redeemed himself at death this way. And uh, Dr. Osiyafu, Dr. Kwame and Krumah allowed him to do so. When Dr. Du Bois died, he was a scholar. He knew somebody would study. Somebody would pick up a book and like what we're doing. We would read. <laughs> and if we start reading, we're going to see a trail that he left for us to, to see. That was an apology to Marcus Garvey. Here's how it works. If we follow the trail, it's going to lead us to Accra, to the west coast of Africa. That's the same route the fifth president of Liberia took to become president of Liberia. Wait a minute. There's some consistencies here. It's a psychological trail. When he died, he left the key point. Here's the trail. He left in study points in reverse. It's Accra, Niagara, Oberlin, his wife Oberlin, Harper's Ferry, Philly. That is the secret trail of the Underground Railroad left by Dr. W. Du Bois, an apology for Marcus Garvey. And that's what we're using right now to Sankofa, right now. Perfect family, perfect. Uh, and family, before we close, I definitely want our brother to share some more key points of. Of, the, of, the, of this Race First book and other chapters. What are some of the other chapters and other key points that stood out for you that, that you'd recommend for people <laughs> to read Pick a chapter, brother. All right, perfect. <laughs> uh, let's do some flipping through the book you know, here. Because that's, that's how we study, correct? But you know what? The Queens would tell us that it's chapter two that we need to look at. Yeah, and then chapter two is, yeah. a, is, is a big focus. But most of what we talk about is really linked with chapter two itself. Because even when we talk about Marcus Garvin first, starting at UNIA, you know, this is all the initiative of, of you know, race for self-reliance. You know, everything that Garvey started doing was, you know, was just self-reliance and self-determination. And it was just different from the other energy of things that was going on in the world. Uh, so that's, so uh, beyond uh, chapter two, we talk about chapter eight, the Black Star Line. Uh, that was a significant right. feat that was never all the way completed, but we can see the initiative that Ooh. was put in place. Oh, you're good. Because freedom is economic, okay? The Black Star Line is business. Right. Because freedom is 
economic. Marcus Garvey, not just him, but those who were involved in creating our government, laid down the beautiful black print for us to follow. Oh, we let's see, let me just make sure we, 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 we look deep at our Let's folks and, and so we can just give them this message directly. Uh, our people laid down our government so sweet. It's just something for us to study and to follow. That's what I'm trying to convey. I'm not the expert on, on universal African nationalism. Our people are the experts on it. We study what they laid down for us and we've got it and bring it to life. It's 100 years ago. Okay. Uh, History is contemporary. What we did 100 years ago, we are doing it right now, right in the face of the oppressor because we are calm and we're following Marcus Garvey. It's just that simple to me as a person. Absolutely, family. And once again, family, we're reading Race First, The Ideology and Organization Struggles of Marcus Garvey and the Universal Negro Improvement Association, what we call UNIA. And yes, family, it did not die. It's still in effect in the modern day times. And my brother here is, rep is, is a great representation of the organization. And uh, do you have a website or any contact information that you want to share? And if not now, sure. we can just leave it in the description sure. box also. Well, uh, you can reach us at ITB Global on Facebook. ITB Global. And what you'll see is information hidden in plain sight. It's the Underground Railroad. Look right at it. Use your third eye and you're going to see this trail and you're going to come home. Stand cold for we're going to go to Ghana. Nigeria, Sierra Leone, these countries that we create as African people and bring it to life as we should. That's as we should. Do the work. And we're here to do the work, brother. You do the work. That's why I love family. you. Uh, we enjoy doing the work and it's, you know, it's, that's what it's uh, It's all about nation building. So family, check us out on the website at africaforthafricans.org and uh, that's our, our Africa Tours and Investment our company which is inspired by Marcos Garvey. And you see the shirt here, Africa for the Africans, inspired by Marcus Garvey. So family, uh, it's that serious. Um, you know, I looked at all of the other uh, visionaries as we studied, you know, during this years of the studying. And it always come out the same. Marcus Garvey had the best vision for black African people that was stolen from their continent. You know? And uh, so family, we keep pushing it, uh, race first, nation building. Link with us uh, and we keep it strong.